Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Locked On Badgers. We have a great guest today, one of the goats of Badger podcasting, the Buck Round. Richard Branch is back. Um, we're going to talk all things Badgers, Badgers football. You're not going to want to miss it on today's episode of Locked On Badgers. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, everybody. I'm Ryan Herring, your host of Locked On Badgers. Thank you for making this one of your first stops every day to get your latest Badger news. Really appreciate it. Um, today's show is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with all the, the props, odds, and lines, everything you need better than before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And, guys, again, we have a great guest coming on today. I've always told you the goal of the show is to build the community, get people smarter than me on the show to talk Badgers. We're going to bring in Richard Branch uh, from the Buck Round, the classic Badgers football podcast. Bringing him in right here. Rich, man, what's going on? Good morning, Ryan. I am, uh, what is going on? I don't know. I'm excited to be here. This is, uh, this is a, a, a familiar yet new experience at the same time. Does that make sense? Uh, it, I haven't done does. one of these in a while where I pretend that strangers want to hear what I have to say about Badger football. So, I don't think you need to pretend. Yeah. I think everybody wants to hear what you have to say. I mean, for for those that don't know, we're going to we're going to jump more into your podcast later because I think it it deserves its own segment in a way. But Rich and Max had the buck around. I, I looked up you guys had 253 episodes and I want to read you one of my favorite reviews. Greatest podcast ever. This was and will be the greatest Badger podcast ever. If I win the lottery, I will pay these clowns a living wage to do this full time. I want that person to uh, <laughs> reveal who they are and back up their statements because I will then scan lottery, uh, you know, winner lists for the rest of my life because, you know, that's a bold statement to make. Thank you, whoever wrote that. But obviously, they need to get out more and listen to more <laughs> podcasts because uh, their experience <laughs> is a little limited. You don't think the bar set too high? No, you guys were great. And when I reached out to you, to you I was hoping um, I, I didn't know if I'd be able to get you on. I'm really excited for it. Uh, we're going to do kind of a, we talked a little offline how we're going to do this. We're going to do a state of the union football show, kind of a, a big picture. Where's the program headed? Paul Christ, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to start here. Um, program trend. If I had to ask you big picture, you know, how do you feel strategically that the program is trending? Do you think it's been getting better, staying the same, getting worse? And let's just take a snapshot over the last four or five years. Uh, all right. So that's basically... Paul Christ, mm -hmm. uh, minus, you know, some tailings there at the very beginning. I, I think the way I put, put it is I think the, I think Badger football is at least as good as it's been, but maybe the teams around that Badger fans look at aspirationally have just gotten better at the same time, I mean, I always talked about Ohio State. I used to call it the Ohio State murder machine uh, back on our show. And Ryan Day and his very aggressive hairline and very yes. dark black hair, which I don't, I mean, there's, there's definitely a bottle situation there. I'm not going to believe him otherwise. But um, there's no way you have that monochromatic ahead of hair That's or true. have the most prototypical coach voice that I've ever heard in my life. Yep, but, 100%. Um, uh, I, uh, yeah, they just, they, they have fine tuned the operation. Um, so I think it's, it, the Badgers definitely have benefited from not having to play Ohio state every year, but I would argue they're in a pretty reasonably healthy place because if you take, let's say even 10 years ago, let's take 10 mm. years ago, if the Badgers were in a battle for a recruit with Ohio state and Michigan or excuse me, uh, Notre Dame in Michigan. I didn't mean to say mm -hmm. Ohio state again. I still have Ryan day on the mind. Um, back then I give the Badgers a 10% or a 25% chance of getting this guy that they want. If it's a target that Notre Dame wanted or Michigan wanted. And I would argue now the Badgers are even money on those guys. I, when I see, Oh, what's his offer list. And it, it, if Ohio state's on there and it's clearly a player that they, that Ohio state wants, I'm like, well, okay, that's an uphill battle. But if it's Michigan or Notre Dame, mm -hmm. they got a puncher's chance there. No problem. I don't say, Oh, well, you know, put that guy aside and, and don't think about him anymore. No, they, they're, they're in that fight. So 
to me, that's a pretty useful barometer in terms of where they are mm-hmm. in, in the, in the larger pecking order. So they're still there. It's just that those, 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 whatever you want to call them, dozen teams, 10 teams, five teams that are on the next level are just accelerating. <laughs> right. And it's a battle to keep up. Um, but I mean, state of the union, Paul Christ, I would say there are things Paul Christ does well that, don't translate well to um, what we see as fans. Like if you're looking for a program manager type, I think Paul Christ is very good at that. He's a very steady hand. He provides stability uh, and a, a cohesive direction and cohesive leadership that you need when you have 120 people trying to work towards a common goal which I think is a real strength, but doesn't, there's no way to really see that as a Mm -hmm. fan. There's no way to really measure that as a fan other than the team is remarkably consistent. Uh, Even a bad Badger team isn't that bad um, with some exceptions, which I know we'll get into in a bit. Uh, But I mean, he's, he wouldn't be a guy I'd be going, I'd be rushing out to replace. I don't think Badger football is, is sick or anything like that at this point. I mean, it has, there are question marks. I mean, if you really want to look at him, he, he's got a lot of Bielema parallels. If you think mm-hmm. about it uh, at this point in his career, he matches up real well with Bielema in uh, what year was the Florida State Bowl? Is that 2008, 2009? I can never remember. Oh, that is horrendous, right? awful. Yeah. The 4047 yeah. or whatever it was. Yeah. I think that's 2000, with their, 2008. Their titanium linked punter that downed us inside the five yard line seven times. Yes. Right. right so, ahead. I mean, that team that had real high expectations mm-hmm. that then turned into a mess, um, not too dissimilar to, you could say, the last two seasons of Badger football. Um, you know, he's at a bit of a crossroads right now, like w- what he can do with the program. And, He's got that because he has, he's a coach whose coaching identity is really built around offense. And this team's identity under his entire tenure has really been defense. It's been defense mm-hmm. and Jonathan Taylor. That's been the mm-hmm. identity of this team since Paul Chris took over. And, you know, again, with the, the Bielma thing, you could say Bielma was a defensive coach that then got known for an offense that was run by the guy that's now the head coach. So, it's it, they look real similar to me. The only difference is Paul Christ has deeper, obvious Wisconsin ties that Brett Bielma didn't and has a, I don't know what to call it, but it, that, that gives that endears him to the fan base in a way that Brett Bielema never had. Cause Brett Bielema had that brashness that Paul Christ is, is anything but brash. But um, I think, I think Bielema almost endeared himself to the other portion of the fan base though, with that brashness. Right. I think fans, some yeah. fans would, would like a little bit more Bielema and Chris. I would maybe put it that way. I think people only want more out of Chris when the team isn't performing. I mean, That's nobody fair. cares when you win. But what I think it's frustrating, and I'll freely admit to me when I'm watching the team, the thing that gets frustrating is, um, you know, when the, when he won't do real, I mean, it's not even be Bielema, it's, I don't know why the answer to who calls the plays on offense has to be a 19 paragraph answer. I mean, it's what Mm -hmm. he explains is what every single team in the country does. Yes. We have a, you know, everybody during the week, all the coaches look at film and they come up with a a set list of plays that we know and we've practiced that we think would work against the tendencies of this team. And then we put together a play card. So it's really a, you know, nobody calls the plays. It's a communal effort. Well, yeah, every flipping team right. in the country does that but then it's who's looking at the play card and just picking the play off there who's is that guy you or is it the offensive corner it's not that hard a thing and then for whatever reason you know again this is more where he doesn't do it too well is when they're in the depths of 2020 and they're the worst offense since you know sure they're uh, he's just decides to say Joe Rudolph's calling the plays yeah. and, and sort of throws him under the bus for some <laughs> unknown reason. But uh, 
which I still look back at and laugh because I'm wondering why he thought that was a good idea at the time to just sort of throw that. He he rayballed Joe Rudolph to use an old reference from yes, the book around. He did. And um, it was very all my references time. are very uh, out of date now. I realize it's like comments about uh, backup defense uh, offensive lineman from the mid uh, from like 2014. So none of I these jokes it. are going to hit. So apologies to everybody. No, they're going to hit but, with the people that used to listen to you. Yeah, it's they, like having Abe Simpson on your podcast. I'm just going to yell at the cloud for. I love it. Hey, but, is, um, is it fair to say with Paul Christ, I, I think he's a tremendously high floor coach and I am in the same boat as you where yeah. I, I, I do not, I mean, I don't think it's broken. I think it needs tweaks. I'm in the same boat. I think he's a tremendously high floor coach. I think from the point he got here to where we are now, I think he's actually recruited better than people. People there, That was a big concern with Chris. Yeah. Right? That was a big concern for me, but it's to your point. I want to dive into this more. It's really the offense. It's Paul Christ's offense that's been broken it's if you had to point to one thing that that's stopped this program from maybe taking that next step under chris it's been the offense is there any reason seven what are we seven years into paul christ here that feels right is there any reason to think it's going to be suddenly fixed because for seven years for the most part it hasn't been that good well so uh, it ties into something i didn't mention yet but one thing that i do think is a strength of paul christ is he has a very good track record with notable exceptions, which we'll get to in a second, which kind of segues into your thought of hiring coaches. Mm -hmm. Um, Obviously, I mean, he inherited Dave Aranda, but the success, the the fact that the defense has not lost its identity and really is the identity of the team at this point, that that has had such continuity with as much turnover as it's had. It's had a lot of turnover because it's been so good, guys get hired away. Um, Just really quick, he's done a point. really good job. Really quick on that point, he because I want to. I think this is really important. I think fans gloss over this, and I just want to take a quick stop. He inherited Dave Aranda, but then he also kept Dave Aranda. Like a lot of coaches come into a spot and they don't keep the the good inheritable pieces. Yeah, I do have my long simmering suspicion with all of that. I think. Barry Alvarez had a big part in Mm -hmm. that um, just to give him a leg up on the way out. I'm not a big Barry Alvarez runs the program guy. He kind of does, but he didn't too. But I think there was a, you really need to keep this guy around. So yes, Paul Chris did it in the end. I don't think Paul Chris wasn't going to be allowed to make that decision. I don't think he would have taken the job uh, if, if he wasn't, but he, um, yeah, he kept Aranda and all the way now through Jim Leonard. I mean, you could say, well, Jim Leonard was a Wisconsin guy. Yeah, but Jim Leonard was, you could argue, picked from coaching obscurity. I mean, he yeah. went from retired to watching film for a few hours to a defensive backs coach for a season to the defensive coordinator, which is a big roll mm-hmm. of the dice and a big gamble. And that has worked. I mean, in some ways, he overshadows Chris at this point uh, in terms of, you know, the mystique of the team. He gets a lot of that. He is the defensive coordinator with mystique. Mm -hmm. Um, So he has really fired there on all cylinders in terms of hiring defensively. And with, I mean, I'd say also with some of the offensive coaches, I mean, Gilmore was solid. I mean, who they've got now with Witted seems like he knows what he's doing to a degree. Um, We'll see with the new guys. This is really going to be the year because Mm -hmm. he had a lot of legacy guys who, certainly hit a ceiling um how much of that was them well i have real feelings about that but uh he did pretty well there but where he struggled is with guys you know like with joe rudolph it's a guy he has a long-standing relationship with this is going to be the first year paul christ is a head coach and joe rudolph isn't his offensive coordinator because he went with him to Pitt, and when bostad jumped to the nfl Rudolph became his off. He became his offensive coordinator because it was supposed to be Bostad. Um, and ever since then, since 2012, he's been his offensive coordinator for a decade. And, you know, it, it was quite obvious. There was some issues there. Um, and it's tricky when it's someone you have a real long standing relationship right. with and you know, okay, I can work with this person. And I know that our, styles our philosophies you know mesh and work but when the thing starts to get stale 
it's it's tricky to navigate it. And there is no other coach in the country, I think, besides Joe Rudolph, where Paul Christ would say, well, you are a bad offensive coordinator and I'm going to demote you and cut your pay, but I'm going to keep you. Right. Um, that dynamic is the weird. That's really one of the weirdest things I've seen in coaching. I'm sure it's happened elsewhere, but you know that there's, there's some baggage there and not necessarily, there I, I know baggage is negative and I don't mean it negatively, but I mean, there's like, there's a long history of interaction and context, I guess is a better word. Yeah. It that felt like a, to make that decision. It kind of felt like a three year, year, like a three year breakup, right? Like a, a, a relationship heading to the rocks for a couple of years going yeah. back to 2020. I mean, year, but I, I don't think uh, uh, Rudolph is a bad coach and it was like, oh, he needs to be fired. I just think it was, they had gotten to a point where this wasn't working for either of them. I think a fresh start is great mm-hmm. for everybody. Um, so maybe this is the year that, you know, Chris gets a fresh start with somebody with some fresh ideas who's going to come in and do something different on offense. I definitely, I think we're seeing um, uh, Bobby Ingram's, uh, uh, fingerprint, at least recruiting wise already, because he's a lot more aggressive with the quarterbacks and at least mm-hmm. putting a name out there. I mean, it used to be with Chris running the offense, quarterback recruiting was outsourced to GAs effectively. It was. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it was Bud Meyer until he was promoted. And then it was Bobby Dunn for a little while who was, I mean, he was just a guy Chris found who, geographically was in the area i mean for those who remember it he was a one spring game quarterback when they had everybody was hurt yep back when we had a spring game as well yeah so he was brought in to be a springtime quarterback because they needed a body and he was a student manager right and then he became a a coach it's kind of crazy um and so it's kind of chris was kind of weird about I, i i don't really have a sense of what what even the quarterback strategy was, it was, okay, can this guy make a certain throw? Okay, we've got one, sign him, we're done. Um, because you can argue if there's a place to be worried about with this team right now, it's quarterback. Um, and I don't just mean, well, Graham Mertz isn't any good, because um, that's a nine-hour discussion on its own there. But it's more like Graham Mertz doesn't, isn't maybe this year he'll be ready. He just wasn't ready to be a starting quarterback right. yet. And no one was even close because Chase Wolf, who seems like a very nice guy and is enjoying his time in Madison as he should is a fifth year player who he's not isn't a power close. five quarterback. He's not a power five quarterback. I mean, that's yep. fine. Um, but he's not a power five quarterback and Deacon Hill is nowhere even sniffing him at yep. this point from everything we know in here. So I mean, it's it's got to be a body coming in. Like they, Miles they Burkett mean, just came in, you know. So that's he, it. Like that's a very important recruit. Yeah. No, it's it's interesting that you you mentioned Bobby Ingram starting to get fingerprints in quarterback recruiting because I I thought this would would have been a class to go out and find a transfer, someone who could just be a reliable backup, someone who can at least push Mertz a little bit because that quarterback room is really light, as as inconsistent as Mertz has been. And we're gonna get into Mertz a little bit in the next segment, but to not have someone behind him that can step in and at least comfortably run the offense. I feel like it's a major concern. I, I, I want to ask you really quick about Paul Chris though. Um, another qu- Paul Chris question here. Does it feel like in big games, he plays it a little too tight to the vest. It feels like when, and this is my, my perspective now, when we're playing in Ohio state, a Penn state of Michigan, it feels like their coaching staffs. When I say their Ryan day, Jim Harbaugh are actually more aggressive and have more talent. Do you worry at all about the X's and O's, the game management with Paul Christ, or is that something you're pretty comfortable with? I, I the only thing I think it was just a the knock, the major on field knock I have of Paul Christ is he does his clock management. He mm-hmm. he gets very tight at the at the half. I mean, so I, tight. I don't half. know how many times I've seen Garrett Groshek run oh. a first and ten draw with a minute forty five to go, and if it doesn't go for a first down. They you run it out. 45 seconds and then you run yep. it out. I mean, he's not a guy who, I mean, he, but I mean, that's from the beginning. I mean, he did it against USC in 2015 in the holiday bowl. I mean, that is his, I remember that game going, well, what exactly was the plan there? Dari's yep. running draws. And I don't really get like, 
you never have a sense that he knows when he wants to go and when he's going to sit on it. I mean, I think that's, I mean, maybe that ties into what you're saying. Um, but I think with his offense, it's always predicated on, he's not going to take that many shots. He's a guy who's going to take shots, but he has to set them up. His shots mm. are very Corey. I mean, his offense is a very heavily choreographed offense. It's a very, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces in there and he's got to get a lot of things line up before he's comfortable with, okay, you know, we have these five shot plays. Let's call one right now. Let's go for it. So I think some of that is built around the athletes in a game like that, less so against Michigan than Ohio state, but definitely with Ohio state, there is a recognition that they don't have the horses there, Mm. especially on offense. Um, and I think a lot of the last two years, especially I would say this for fans who have not seen the Badgers live, what really, so I, I saw the Badgers live once last year. Um, you and I were talking about this before we did the show, but I went to see them play the glorious state university of New Jersey, otherwise known as Rutgers and myself and, you know, 7,000 of my closest Badger fan fan friends were there. And uh, I don't know other ones who were there, but it was a 52 to three game, which to you says blowout Mm -hmm. destruction derby. Wow. They were great. But when I'm sitting there at the game, the only thing I could take away from it, the biggest takeaway for me was one, this team is massively overmatched. Actually I have three takeaways. I always say I have one thing, but then I have more because they start to say that. Uh, one Rutgers was massively overmatched Two, Keanu Benton is insane. Right. Um, and three Graham Mertz is late on every single throw he makes. And even against a team that's massively overmatched, he's, he's just late. And the reality is they have a quarterback that I think has them pretty limited, uh, this year. He has physical talents in a way, like a guy like, you go back to a Joel Stavi. Mm-hmm. Sure. Chris, you know, in that last year with Joel Stavi, when Joel Stavi, I mean, he was 11 touchdown, 12 picks. He did not have a good year by any stretch. Um, but there were certain reads that he expected Joel to make and whether or not he could make the throw. Because for Joel, it was always, well, he might make the read, but then he'd miss the throw. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Graham, it's not so much that. It's he can make all the throws. He can't make the read. Uh, it just, if you want to sum the two of them up in one sentence, um, he doesn't have a trust in, in Graham Mertz uh, to, to do things in this offense. And I mean, you saw it early in the year. He thought he had more than he had. He did. I, mean, I agree. The Notre Dame game and the Penn state game and everything early in the season was, was a quarterback who was like treading water to keep trying to keep his head above water. That was it. I mean, he was, he was drowning out there. So going to watch them live, you say, okay, he's not, he's taking shots against a terrible team to try to get this guy able to make reads. But like he, he makes a, I don't know what it was, a 50 yard throw to Danny Davis that sets up a touchdown where had he thrown the ball three steps earlier, it's, it is a touchdown. It's six and it's over. it's, It's a score or uh, there's, you know, some crosses in the middle where you like the, the throw is there. If you threw it before, you know, Ferguson cuts. Well, let me and, ask you this. Let me ask and, you this. Cause I think this, this dovetails into what you're saying. Is it a good thing that, that Chris offense has so many moving parts and so many things you need to set up to set something up? Cause we've heard several times it's a difficult offense. There's a lot of pieces, a lot of, maybe it just needs to be easier. Maybe, I don't know. Like, I think there's, I think there, listen, I don't think everything is, or things are always one or the other. I think there's middle ground in a lot of areas, but I think his offense has gotten a little stale. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there has to be a recognition of that on some level. I mean, it, it, uh, one of the f- weirdest things I saw the Badger football Twitter account put out um, or their social media team put out, I guess on most of their platforms was this interview with Joe Ferguson, I think at the senior bowl or or the (laughs) pre-draft thing. And he's like, man, I came here. Our offense is so much more complicated than this. And I, I get what the intention because the Mm -hmm. audience for that account I'm coming around to more and more is a recruiting audience. It's not me as a fan. Now it's really focused on 
getting people interested in Badger mm-hmm. football. And I got what the point of that was, was to be like, look, we're going to get you ready for the NFL. If you come here, look how complicated our offense mm-hmm. is. Looks into what Joe Ferguson is saying is learning the offense was so easy. And it's like, well, yeah, but you were like 60 something in the country in points. Like it's not a good, right. you know, yards, per, yards per play was not great. Like it's not, it's not a good sell. So, yeah, I mean, I think some of that is, again, Chris working off the idea that against an elite team, I don't necessarily have the same horses they do. So I need to mask it and I need to create, uh, you know, make it hard for for the mic to figure out where, where, you know, where the balance is, you know, for all those kinds of things and throw off gap schemes. That's really what his offense is. It's always throwing off the gaps mm-hmm. for the defense. Um, but I guess if you don't have guys who get it, it doesn't work. The, but the flip side of that, and which is why I'm not all doom and gloom, because I only like to be doom and gloom when people are happy as the <laughs> Lord of darkness. Um, I think there is a flip side to it, which is, I mean, Graham Mertz, really wasn't supposed to be a star. He wasn't supposed to be a starter in 2020 flat out. Right. I mean, there was an injury to cone and then you had that weird Illinois game, which I never want to hear about again, where he just comes out firing. And I think that, that, you know, the million dollar question is always going to be if Graham Mertz doesn't go 20 for 21 against Illinois, what did last year look like? I mean, does that, force their hand to make him the starter because I he's made Chris has made two bad mistakes in the last two years right Mm, I mean he's really laying on two mistakes one he said I need to make Joe Rudolph the offensive coordinator so I can be the head coach more and I can do more head coach stuff and less Mm -hmm. offensive coordinator well that didn't work because then he took the play calling back which then implies either he was a bad he's such a bad offensive coordinator you're giving those duties up the head coach big picture stuff you're supposed to be managing or what you said there just didn't make any sense. And he never was really asked about that, which was always kind of a bummer to me. Um, Cause I'd be curious what he has to say about that. Well, you, you know what he would say though. He, he wouldn't say anything. I mean, in real yeah, but you still Chris, ask would, it. You I, think, ask I agree. It. I think you got to ask it, but you would never get anything out of Paul Chris. That'd be substantive. I, I, in my opinion, it would just be, you wouldn't get your curiosity. itch scratched is what I'm saying. No, but I would be more interested to see him at least attempt to muddle his way through that answer. Right. Than having somebody fishing for a quote for their article about Jay, Jay Shaw's transfer from Cal. Right. Like, that's more interesting fair. to me. No, it's like, very fair. When, when he could be asked that versus, you know, somebody who's at the availability, who's clearly just fishing for a quote that they know the answer to already, but they need, you know, that third paragraph for the article to have a quote from Paul Christ in it. That's not doing me a service as a fan, as a, reader, as a weirdo as a who, wa- who watches Paul Christ's, media availabilities on YouTube and likes to torture myself with them. Um, But uh, his other big mistake, I would argue, I mean, and it's an obvious one was after 2020, he looked at Graham Mertz and said, I'll fix you. Mm -hmm. I'll make this work. And how much of that is team Mertz putting pressure and I'm using air quotes for people who are listening and not watching. Getting used to the video thing is very Oh, yeah. Weird. I'm You're actually watching great. myself. Well, I'm watching myself talk, which is kind of weird. You're doing great. Um, but being a narcissist, it works great. <laughs> but I would say the, the, you know, making the decision that it's Mertz over Cone was an interesting one. And one that I said, well, if he's doing it, because he's so risk averse, as we talked about earlier, this means this guy's the goods. Because... Jack Cohn was a very high floor quarterback. He was. Yep. Um, a very, I know he wasn't exciting and you know, his personality <laughs> was a little uh, milk toasty, but he gave you a very high floor and an efficient floor. So my reading was, well, if Chris is rolling the dice on this, he really thinks this guy can do it. And he was dead wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously it, for, I was again, going back to Bucker on days. I was never, I was stop screaming at Joel Stavi, stop screaming at Alex Hornibrook. They are what they are. Like they're not mm-hmm. great quarterbacks, but they are. And they're not going to become are. great quarterbacks. And there's not, 
the, the problems you see in the offense aren't just them. Uh, this last year, I was officially the quarterback guy, which was stop screaming about the offensive line. Yeah, the offensive line is bad, but this is the worst quarterback play mm -hmm. since average and cheer. It really was. I mean, it was a guy who was so underwater, so out of his out of sorts, so out of his element, so incapable of playing that don't who cares if they can't run block? He can't hand the ball off and he's throwing, I think it was five picks over the course of eight passes mm -hmm. at one point. I mean, it was insane. Especially I mean, early season. Yeah, he was so far, and that's what I'm talking about. He was yeah. so far behind the curve. Um, so it, it it was a real, you know, that was a real mistake. And it's this is the year, like Chris has to rebound from those two mistakes. It's a it's a two year process to rebound from that. Um, well, that's a great segue because that's what we're going to get into next. We're gonna we're gonna transition next into this season, how important it is. Um, and I'm excited to hear your take on that. But uh, coming up first, guys, we are going to get into today's sponsor for the show. Today's sponsor is Bet Online. Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs, information, prop bets, number one source for all your latest odds, contests, futures, and it remains the best spot for all your sports developments, podcasts, reviews for all leagues, all seasons. I've said it a bunch of times. It's a great place to go do your futures, right? Wisconsin, the over under is 8.5. Probably ping Rich on that, see where he's at. As you all know, I'm kind of a homer. I went over. I went over last year, so that didn't work out. Great place. Uh, if you're an NFL guy who's going to win AFC, NFC, et cetera, the pennant races are heating up. Basketball, you can now get in on the futures. The draft is over. So Bet Online is a wonderful spot. If you do it responsibly, have some fun, test your sports knowledge. Also, live Vegas games, roulette, blackjack. Um, so not just, not just sports. Website's easy to use, intuitive. Head to the website today. Use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. Thank you guys again for making Lockdown Badgers your first listen every day. Absolutely thrilled to have Rich on the show. Going to continue bringing him back in from the Buck Around, the GOAT Badger podcast, as I always like to say. And I want to kind of transition, Rich. First of all, once again, just thanks for the time. I don't know if I've even thanked you yet today on the show. So we really do Well, I've it. been simmering about that for the last <laughs> 35 minutes. I'm furious, actually. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it is very appreciated. And I know people are going to get a kick out of listening to you talk about the Badgers once again, probably get a lot of requests to do it more often. Um, I want to talk about this season, the importance of this season. Where, where does this season need to go for you to feel good about the, the Badgers offense, Badger football, Paul Christ? Well, it, that's really what it is. I think, I think for Paul Christ to, you know, you can lump 2020 and 2021 together. They're really just one supersized season, as far as I'm concerned. The COVID thing makes it so wonky and so weird. And for me, I watched 2020, and I kind of almost said, why am I even watching this? Just because mm -hmm. everything, there was so, it was such a mess. And I don't just mean the football was bad. It was just, there was too much, too many variables, too much going on, games canceled, practices on, practices off, that you kind of were like, I, I'm not taking anything good or bad from any of it because there's just no way to take anything from it. Um, but a decent amount of it, I guess, you know, you, you saw 2021 and that shook out and you saw a team that is struggling for an offensive identity, I think. Um, and what do you need to see? I think you need to see an offense that's functional. You really do. I think you need to see an offense that can actually do something for this team. I don't think it has to be uh, a 50 point per game juggernaut. I'm not saying that's what you need to see. And well, now you have a Paul Christ offense because I think that's mostly Badger fan fiction. Mm -hmm. Like it's not going to be 2010 or 2011 every year. It's just not, but you need to see an offense that can actually win a game for this team you need to see an offense that can keep the defense off the field a little bit because mm -hmm. it, it became clear in this past year that there were times that that, just, that defense just got gassed uh, on more than one occasion. Um, and it was a pretty good, I mean, it was, it was a really good defense. And I think it wasn't even as good as it didn't statistically doesn't reflect how good it was in my mind because of that. So for it to be a successful year, you, you got to win 19 games. I mean, you need it. You need a ten and two season. You need to get this thing 
sort of back on even footing. I mean, it's going to stink because they got Ohio State's, I think, is it the first conference game? Yeah. Yeah, they got Ohio State week four, and that's a roadie, which is tough. They got Michigan State. I think they go to East Lansing for that one. We'll see what Michigan State is. Uh, I'm curious. I I feel like, uh, I don't know. I'll just be curious to see what Michigan Mm -hmm. State is at Mm -hmm. this point. Like, I mean, they had a great year, but that one just kind of felt weird. It was weird, but sometimes that first weird spot is like the the first spot in a new trend line too. You know, to yeah. your point, you, you just don't know. But you are going on the road there. Like roadies are always tough. I think you have to go. Uh, Minnesota comes to Wisconsin. It's not an easy schedule with the crossovers. Wisconsin has had easier schedules. I'll say that. Although the non conference yeah. is pretty 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 much I mean, of a layup. Yeah, I, I'm assuming Washington State's going to be bad, and then it's two money games. So. Mm-hmm. It, let me to let your me ask, question from the ad. I think they can hit nine. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's where I'm at too. I'm at nine. I'm at over 8.5, but barely because there's always yeah. going to be a loss to somebody you don't expect. It's just because that's just kind maybe. of how college football works. Well, we say always say maybe, but then there's an Illinois, there's a BYU, there's an yeah. Indiana. Like recent history suggests it'll happen. Um, let yeah. me let me ask you this. The new coaches that that Paul Chris brought in, obviously we talked about, we touched on it a little bit. I, I would say the biggest ones, you know, Bobby Ingram coming in to be the offensive coordinator slash kind of quarterbacks coach, although I'm not really sure the mechanism there. Bob Boston moving over, Al Johnson becoming the running backs coach. If here's kind of where I want to go. If this if this offense doesn't look functionally better, to your point, it doesn't. It's not going to be a super team offense. But if it doesn't look functionally better with the new coaches that Paul Chris has brought in. Does it feel like he's kind of fired his bullets at that point? Uh, I mean, not after one year. Okay. I, I think it, for me, the big variable is how functional is Graham Mertz. And to answer your question, I actually think I have a, a sense of what the quarterback situation is going to be. It's gonna oh, be, let me hear it. In, Ingram is play calling slash game plan film review. And um, uh, th- why am I forgetting his name? The QC, uh, the quarterback guy. Uh, yeah, anyways, I, someone can respond to this and yell at us on the internet to say, I'm drawing a blank as well. forgetting. but that's, that is mechanics. And that is, uh, you know, make yourself a better physical quarterback type guy. So I think, think that's the way it splits. Uh, it's, Kellen, Chris it's, it's, still... it's Chris. It's Keller Chris. Why am I forgetting? That? Keller Chris. Oh yeah. That's an easy one. Don't yell at me. If you already yelled at me, you, you were too quick to reply. And, and Paul um, Chris, do you think he's still involved coaching quarterbacks or do you think he's mostly off to the side on that at this point? I mean, I'm sure he's dips his toe, but not to the degree. I mean, we'll see. We'll see how good a coach Keller Christ is. I mean, right. it, it's some of the moves. Are, Al Johnson is a running back coach. Is I whatever. I, I, Paul Christ has has a really good track record of hiring coaches. It's true. So let's see. But that one is a puzzler for me, especially because Al Johnson's Twitter is mostly moving pictures. He's really fun to follow. He is like he is. He's solid suburban dad. He, he looks there. like you're every man, right? Like, yes, you would, you would want a beer with Al Johnson. Like I think Al Johnson and I were probably going to be standing next to each other in the home Depot talking <laughs> yes. about which lawnmower to buy. Yep. Um, and he'd probably have a great, he'd probably have a great take on it. He'd probably he might. Know the exact yes. one. He very no, well might. It, it is strange to me. Cause I I'm right there with you with the Paul Christ uh, track record for hiring assistants. I think he's done really well, but it still feels like, I don't know that it still feels like at times he dips into the Wisconsin well a little too much. Well, he's done it on defense. I mean, he hired Bob Bostead to couch, to couch linebackers. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I can't say coach all of a sudden. Um, that was the weirdest, mm-hmm. stupidest hire I've ever seen. Well, clearly I was wrong. It worked. Um, I mean, it worked. It worked. did work. Uh, yeah. Apparently Bob Bostead can coach linebackers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he brought in like, why did he hire Tim Tibisar? Like that guy was fired as the Purdue defensive coordinator, like, and he's been out of the NFL for a couple of years. Or Bobby April, like you look at these guys, you go, these are weird hires. They worked. They have worked. Um, Witted's worked. Uh, I would actually say under the radar, one of the one one of the coaches that I think, and I don't know how he got brought in if this was more of a Leonard or a Chris, but Poteet, I think, mm-hmm. is a really interesting hire. Like he seems to be a dude who helps them on a couple fronts. He seems like he can recruit. And he also seems like having a dedicated cornerbacks coach helped stabilize that defense because Jim Leonard's use of cornerbacks was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. Prior well, to I always thought, coach there. I always thought that was really oddly balanced. So I, I always thought when, when Leonard came in, you can't have a guy who's even as bright as Leonard is, who's 
a first or second year defensive coordinator who was also coaching the entire secondary. It, it was just too much on his plate, I thought. So bringing in that secondary coach, that cornerbacks yeah. coach, it gives him the ability to more focus on the DC stuff, which I think right. was a really smart move. And well, I think, point, I think also was good. made the personnel usage smarter yeah. and better. The rotation, they were, the rotation was bizarre, and they were also churning yep. through people who'd leave, I think, because it was kind yep. of chaotic. Let um, me ask you this with Mertz, because we're kind of talking this year. You've mentioned Mertz a couple times. Is it pretty fair to say, I mean, obviously we would agree Mertz has been incredibly underwhelming. Is it fair to say Wisconsin has failed him in providing an ecosystem to – I mean, he's had a different coach every year. He has not had NFL receivers for the most part, right? Jake Ferguson's a tight end, but Danny Davis, Kendrick Pryor, certainly not um, certainly not Quintez Cephas. Again, if you give a young quarterback a different offensive coordinator every year, different quarterback coaches, subpar to average receivers, and an offensive line that isn't living up to the Wisconsin standard – I think if you're Graham Mertz, you can kind of also, and not that he's come out and said this, but you could say, hey, I, I really haven't been given the best opportunity to, to develop as a quarterback. I see you disagreeing with that, I'm not, which, is, I, I, which is fine. Okay. I mean, but no, okay. <laughs> I yeah, don't think fair. so, because uh, go look at uh, the Elite 11 winners from 2014, mm -hmm. pick a year. You're going to know of those 11 guys, you're going to know, you're like, oh, three of them were good. Right. I've heard the names of four of them because they transferred like 67 times. Right. And then the other, you know, what, is, what does that leave me with? Four or seven, four more. I have no idea who these people are. Quarterbacks, hit, the hit rate on quarterbacks is so weird. It's so fair. who knows? Um, my only argument, uh, only other part of that is I don't think he was underprepared. I just think he largely was a victim of circumstance. And I also would say if he didn't think he was ready to play this year, he could have said, no, uh, you, you don't have to tell Jack Cohn he has no shot at this job. Like, he could stay and play another year. Uh, I also think Jack Cohn would have done a better – I really do. I mean, I think Jack Cohn would have done a better job with this offense than he would have because it requires – Yeah, I agree um, with that. A little bit more of the football IQ and a less of the um, gun – not gunslinger because he's not a gunslinger. That's such a lame uh, – metaphor sim whatever it is metaphor right uh to use but he's much more of a an instinctual quarterback mm -hmm. than well, a I guy think clearly like he would have been better i mean I, we saw cone be better at wisconsin like he clearly right. would have been better well i mean you my know? argument would also be uh, mertz has not had the marinating time mm -hmm. jack cone developed as a wisconsin quarterback go back and look at when he played uh against purdue Right. I mean, he he would go out there. and He looked like a baby deer on the field. Uh, you you kind of forget that he was so bad when mm -hmm. when he first was on the field because he was out there when he wasn't ready to be on the field. Um, but he was a quarterback without some spectacular arm. So his mistakes and his shortcomings were we're not letting you throw anything downfield. Just if nothing's there, you're going to look scared and some you know, 280 pound glute is going to bury you in the turf at some point, uh, or you're going to throw a bad pick in the flat. Mm -hmm. Whereas Graham Mertz's mistakes are going to be a lot more spectacular because he knows he can make a throw or attempt to make a throw that a guy like Cone wouldn't do, but so we'll what, see. What Maybe they your... make Mertz a check down King. Like that's yeah, what was, he really just needs to be. I was going to ask you kind of about that to take the next step and kind of finish the segment off. What does your gut tell you about this season? Do you at the at the end of this season are we going to look back and say, yeah, pretty good. Mertz made a jump. The offense looks better. I feel great about these these hires. Um, we're, I have no idea. No I idea. The one thing that I would, uh, I'm more curious. Like I think the Bostead mania needs to tone down a little bit. I'm part like, of that group, by the way. I, I get it. Like again, we're dealing with mm -hmm. you know Rose Bowl fan fiction. Mm -hmm. I think um, I, I'm sure the, I mean, the offensive line theoretically should be decent, but he's also working with a ton of talent. Like he's never, I mean, he never had the talent he has there now. Right. I mean, he's got, gosh, I mean, how many four stars? Uh, I mean, let's put it this way. I'll put this a different way. Like if we're talking about like, is Paul Christ failing the program because Graham Mertz isn't doing great and he's this super high level recruit. You only say that because it's quarterback. You don't say that because Logan Brown is a ghost. Like Logan mm -hmm. Brown is the highest rated recruit on the team. And he's been a ghost. I know he's been hurt and all that stuff, but I think there's a really decent chance. That guy isn't even a starter this year. 
I would agree with that. And if he's not a starter this year, I think there's a really good chance you never see him. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I've kind of come around to the idea if by your but by your redshirt sophomore t- season, you're not in a rotation, chances are we're never going to see you. Mm-hmm. Like I used to be, well, development, development, development. But the way the program works now, like redshirt freshmen should be filling out special teams. You should see guys like when you go in and you look at look at game stats, you should be like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that. Uh, okay, let's use Logan Brown since I mentioned Logan Brown played in 14 games last year. How did? Oh, well, because he's on the extra point. You know, right. he's on the extra point. You know, like if you're not in the mix for those things, chances are you're not going to percolate up because there's going to be another guy who's going to be right behind you who could do it. Especially um, with the young talent to specifically at those spots. There, there's guys there. Yeah. I mean, there's four star dudes all over this thing yep. who are any, I mean, and fives. You got Nolan Rucci, who's just sort of floating around. We'll see what happens with him. He's going to need another year probably. So but, one of the things I've floated around is it's very possible. And I think this might begin to your point a little bit. I, I, I'm a big fan of the Bostead move over to offensive line, but it's very possible the offensive line gets better because this talent just matures and Bostead yeah. gets a disordinate amount of credit for that. Could I mean, be. It's very possible. Um, I mean, I don't really care. I just think they're going to get better. Yeah, either you know way. I mean, like, I don't the care. The same. I mean, I think the, the biggest difference between him and Rudolph is going to be Rudolph ran the offensive line kind of like a basketball team in that he had an eight man rotation. And so you had five starters Mm -hmm. you had an interior guy who could fill and then you either he could either fill three spots or you shuffled around and then you had a tackle who would fill in on one side or the other and then you had one other sort of flex guy in there who might be that fullback type who you'd use in those jumbo sets or in a pinch would be the another extra lineman i think bostad you know that it seems to be he's not going to be doing that stuff, right? That's the big thing is they're not cross-training interior, exterior. He's not doing as much Mm. shuffling. See how that works? I mean, they have the talent depth to do that. You shouldn't have to do that. I agree with you. I I thought the shuffling hurt hurt the team, hurt the other line. I think it's going to be better. I I do want to pause here and jump to one more quick ad read, and then I want to come back and talk a little bit about how the podcast changed you as a fan, if it did. I'm very curious about this. Sure. All right, guys, uh, can, we're going to keep Rich on the show again. As always, the goal is to get smarter people on the show. Rich definitely qualifies as that. Um, so we're going to continue to bring great guests. Appreciate everybody tuning in to Locked on Badgers. Today's show is brought to you by the following sponsors. All right, we're bringing Rich back into the show. Those will get inserted later. So bringing Rich back into the show, I want to talk to you a little bit specifically about the buck around the podcast. I spent Two, I said 253 episodes was the total. I don't know if you know that off the top of your head or not, but that's amazing. Yeah, I knew it was around 250. So how did that – my first question is, how, did that change you as a fan? Are you a different fan now after having done the podcast for, for years and years and years? Yeah, I think 100%. I think for me, uh, when I did, when we were doing the podcast – I would, I would watch Badger games and, you know, absorb what was put out to me in terms of whether it was media coverage or like, as I call it, primary source stuff, like press conferences and things like that. Um, I would start to look at it more as uh, less as, Ooh, I really like watching the Badgers win football. It really became, Ooh, I really like content. And what just happened is great content for me. And Mm. especially, uh, uh, like my viewing habits changed when, when we did the pod, I would watch the game and then I would get the game. Re- after it was over, I'd get the game recap and Sunday night, sit there with my game recap and rewatch the game. Um, and uh, basically watch plays without any kind of like tension in it. If that makes sense, without any, uncertainty of what's going to happen so it made me i mean i guess i'm still a badger fan i mean i have badger t-shirts up in my room but i would say uh it's made me far far more objective and far less emotional about Mm. the badgers like i i view them on a some level maybe a little bit of detached curiosity um but more from like i'm trying to I'm a person who likes to understand how things work and it's impossible to do again with 
a 120 person organization, but I'm always trying to do it <laughs> and, uh, you know, trying to sort of spot trends and look at events and variances and say, does this fit my theory? Is this like what I think? Does this confirm what, what my preconceived notions are? Or am I just looking at the world with blinders? Um, Cause I still do that. Like not, I mean, obviously not doing the pod anymore, but I like to watch the Badgers with a degree of detachment and I find it far more uh, enjoyable. It's like you evolved <laughs> as, as a sports fan. You're like a higher life form now. I might just be an older person. <laughs> like, you know what? I, you know, I'm going to be 46 in October. Uh, you know, right. testosterone levels are declining. I mean, I can't lie. <laughs> <laughs> is there, is there ever an urge desire to get back into it? Is there ever a thought or is it just, is that part of your life kind of over you think? <sighs> Here's what I would say. Um, the podcast landscape is very different than when um, when back when the buck around was on and putting out shows every week. And I think the big difference would be you can monetize a lot easier. Like there's Patreon. Patreon really wasn't a thing back then. Mm. Um, and I was kind of like, I, I know it was around. And I think even in one of the early episodes, I said, look, we're never doing a Patreon. We're not going to ask you for money. And I would think about it not to make money, but to outsource a lot of the work in producing right. the show. Uh, because like I was saying before, like a, a, a buck around production week for me, and that makes it sound way more important than it was. And I called it a production week would be you'd watch the Badger game, right? Then Sunday night, I'd rewatch the Badger game. And a rewatch goes faster because you can skip halftime. You can skip, you know, there's no commercials, all that mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, if you're really lucky, there was like five or six guys on YouTube who upload games with everything cut up and it would be great. So a game would only be like an hour and 20 minutes, uh, but you'd still have every snap. Uh, you know, so I'd do that rewatch. So that would be, call it two hours, round numbers. Then it would be, all right, we need an agenda and Max and I would sort of trade thoughts, you know, and that would be an ongoing thing, but call that another hour. Then we'd sit down for 90 minutes and record the show. And, you know, you'd need 15 minutes like, like you and I did before, you know, mm -hmm. pulling back the curtain, people don't realize this. Ryan and I didn't just say hello and hit you know, like hit record and then say, well, hello, Ryan, how are you? I am rich. Like, you know, you talk for 10 or 15 minutes, you, you get, yep your blood flowing. You know what I, I mean? You know that stuff. Yep. you got to do that. So you're in the mentality of doing it. Cause if you go in cold, it starts flat. It doesn't out. work. Yeah. So, you know, you've got 90 minutes there. So now you're up to like watching the game. Then the, you know, like all the extra stuff I've done is like already three hours. Then after the show, I was a big, um, well, I'm a big narcissist and I need to sound smart. So it's like, go back and let's, cut this thing up and make it a little more coherent takes out take out my ums and ahs which everyone will notice are be i'm not important. taking any of those out by the way i know you're gonna make sound like <laughs> an idiot in there. um and all of my uh, inaccurate facts or something like that but you know we would have a we would effectively a 55 minute show would take you know it would be an hour let's say an hour and 15 minutes of material and we would just consolidate it a little mm -hmm. bit and clean it up and shorten it and make the make the discussions a little more coherent because it's for people to listen to while they're doing something. So your thoughts have to be coherent. Like you and I were, you said, Oh, I was used to listen to the buck around while I was cutting the grass. Right. Well, I that's did. the way podcasts are. People don't just sit. I mean, there are some weirdos who sit in dark rooms and listen to podcasts, but they're in the minority. Most people are doing something, yep. whether it's commuting or attacking you know? the lawn. Yep. I listen to it when I clean my house. I love to vacuum and listen to podcasts. It's a very calming experience. Don't ask me why, but I love it. Uh, you know, so you're doing something and you just have it on. So you're mm -hmm. giving it 80% of your attention. So it has to be clear and coherent. Um, so to do that, you'd have to edit. Well, editing one hour of audio takes, would take me three hours. You know, by the time I was done, edited, put it together, post it up to the internet. Because, uh, you know, a show, we would record Monday nights and my goal was let's have it on people's phones Tuesday morning for their commute type of thing. And, you know, so by the time it was done, it's a, it's a 10 hour endeavor. Right. So, but most of that endeavor is not the show. It's 
making the show sound good. So my goal, which is a very long winded answer to your question was, I haven't done this for a while, so you got to put up with me. No, I love is, it. I would want to have some kind of like a Patreon structure for an editor. Right. And I would want an editor. I'm not going to ask somebody, hey, was somebody out there want to edit for me for free so I can have free time, but you don't have free time. No, I would right. want to pay an editor. And I would want to pay an editor what they're worth. Like people deserve to be paid what they're worth. Like it's just sort of a general belief mm-hmm. I have in life. Um, That's pretty fair, fair belief. <laughs> and so... To do that, you'd need to have some kind of Patreon structure or something like that. So if, so theoretically, if I could do it where we could do it on our own terms, which is one of the things I liked about that show. If there was nothing to talk about, we just said, we're not doing a show this week. Right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get upset about uh, Bruce Feldman's latest listicle about best college sports towns in America. Like right. I, I, you had the freedom to, to determine your schedule and your content. Cause we didn't need to, there was no need for us to drive clicks. Right. Um, so if we could do that again, where if, if I could have a structure like that, where I could do maybe. So the long answer is, is maybe, but probably not. That's the that's the summation. Right. That was six thousand words to say maybe, but probably not. <laughs> oh, that's interesting, though. No, I, I think I think it's a really good kind of trip behind the scenes for people, though, who probably don't realize the amount of work that goes into just producing that 30 minute, that one hour audio segment yeah. if you're trying to do it well. And if you're doing it all on your own with tools that, quite frankly, you probably learned on your own to some degree. It was all home. It was e Well, you know what? Uh, Ty Hildenbrandt from The Solid Verbal. Oh, I love Ty. Was the first person who, like, he sent me a bit. I pinged him on uh, Twitter and basically asked him, hey, I'm interested in doing a podcast. You got any advice? You know, email, you know, richbranch at thebuckaround.com or whatever it was. And sent me a big, long, you know, 12-point oh, thing. Oh, that's awesome. Here's what you need to do. And then the rest of it was a lot of Google searches and it was mm-hmm. all kind of homemade tools and there's way better and more robust now just because there's more podcasts. I mean, when, when we started the buck around, there was the ESPN one, um, the ESPN out the jump around mm-hmm. was base. I think it, it was us in the jump around and then Bucky's fifth. I mean, but now there's a ton of them. So people could, you know, can find them. Mm-hmm. So there's not like there's a, Part of why we did it was we felt like there wasn't anybody doing it and we felt like somebody should do it. But now there's people doing it. So there's not like a big need for I don't have any profound and different ideas. I really don't. I don't know because, about that. I think I think you have a pretty I mean, I am very voice. profound. Don't get me wrong. You are. Well, yeah. easy. <laughs> I was going to say, I think you do have a very unique voice, though. And I think that's partially why the, the buck around was such a success and why people really enjoyed it. I think it probably remains to this day, not not to. Um, inflate your ego any further pretty soon and your head's not going to fit in my screen here but it's a very you know, big head very big head too i so think it's still the highest rated badgers podcast and i think it's rightfully so you guys did a great job starting off hmm. and building that community i think you built it the right way like you you really built it out of a desire to create something for badger fans which i always really respected yeah um, thanks i would say this i'm gonna wrap up here because i've already taken you for an hour um but i got nowhere to go well don't say that <laughs> then we can talk another 30 minutes about warren herring and Phil Welch and all sorts. We go down all sorts of rabbit holes. Um, but I would say this. I would love to uh, – totally up to you, but at some point in the football season, if you're interested to have you jump back on, it would be great. Sure. That would be awesome, man. I mean, all I have to do is come here and talk. That's and then it. I just – I go, you edit. And I all that away. editing stuff you talked about, <laughs> you don't have to do any of that here. So everybody, he is Richard Branch, Rich Branch. Yeah. What do you go by now, by the way? Is it Richard or Rich? I'd... Sure. It doesn't matter. Okay. I, just don't call me Dick. You know, get, as, as a Richard, show. the dicks kill me. Got you. Don't so, cut that and take it out of context. But no, uh, we'll, we'll leave that in. So, I didn't get. Uh, yeah. You cut me off, by the way. And one thing I get to say. Oh, go ahead. Finish my I have two. Pe- my advice for Badger fans about things they don't need to worry about. Oh, perfect. Because I, I can't hear about this anymore. And I've been trying to figure it out because it's been making me insane. And the thing that's been making me insane is Saeed Khalif idolatry. That is how I want to close the show today for you. If, or my my portion of, of my visit. Here, I love it. If I will. I can't take any more Saeed Khalif idolatry. No more. Put it on the shelf. The Badgers, believe it or not, know that they need to recruit. Believe it or not, the people in the athletic department understand they need employees. 
believe it or not, they understand this is a very competitive thing. But I want to just say one thing on this. And I understand why you're all angry and riled up and upset about Saeed Khalif. And at first I didn't get it, but I've been thinking about it. And mm -hmm. I realized what it is. It's really frustrating to be a Badger fan. And it's not just because it's like, oh, they get so close and they lose close games and they break my heart. It's that we are basically fed the same cycle of information every year. It's, okay, let's start in the spring. We get a 25-minute Paul Chris press conference. Then you're going to get a few practice reports. And then you're going to get summertime and it gets quiet. And then Graham Mertz and uh, Chimri DK are running a football camp, which is mm -hmm. just vanilla nothing and but whatever. You're, you're being spoon-fed a little bit of news. And then you get to August and – you find out that, you know, uh, Jay Shaw had a uh, scooter accident and fell in Lake Mendota and tore his ACL. And now he's not playing, you know, something that actually didn't happen. But I'm just thinking goodness that I, right now is going to Google. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, you get the same cycle of information. And then it's at Monday, you get eight minutes of Paul Christ talking about the game. And then Friday, he gets another availability where you get five minutes of YouTube video you can watch, maybe seven minutes. And at the end of seven minutes, he's starting to look around going, are we done? Are we done? Are we done? And it's the same information. So whenever there is a new piece of information introduced, mm -hmm. like I can remember the big one, the 10-year-old version of Saeed Khalif being the greatest recruiter in the history of college football was recruiting budgets was yeah. when recruiting budgets became a thing that ESPN published in like 2008, 2009. And everyone was like, why aren't the Badgers spending? They're not spending any money. They're at the bottom. Of the They're at the bottom and I can't believe this. And like 50% of it was just how things were accounted for. Mm -hmm. Like it's just where this wasn't in a recruiting budget. It's in a different budget. Or it was, well, if they just spent – if you thought that if they spent $200,000 more, they'd all of a sudden get all five-star recruits. Do you think they'd do that? Yeah, they would. This, this doesn't matter. But it was a new piece of information. So it gave you a new piece of information that you really only presented one side of, but it makes you hyper-focused because you're a Badger fan who starved for content. Right. And now you're getting new content and you're going to focus on it. So what was it, a year ago? When Jesse to Temple, to his credit, gets a great interview like jesse's yep. always hustling trying to do new things jesse's a great guy who was on the buck around all the time so this is no knock of jesse jesse deserves credit for this because he at least gave us something new to talk about albeit people are hyper reactive to it but yep. uh you know jesse gets in there and talks to saeed khalif who on his <laughs> saeed khalif needs to think about hr he and understand in. like you need to think about how your words are going to be heard so good for saeed hopefully he never has to get a new job <laughs> because you don't want to burn your bridges. But Saeed Khalif comes out and says, I know how to recruit everybody. I mean, I know I'm oversimplifying and making this trite, but you hear, you know, he's saying like, we don't, I don't have all the tools and we're, we're not, you know, the Badgers aren't being everything they can be. So everybody is like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. The Badgers are failing. The sky is right. falling. They're terrible. I hate being a Badger fan because they're never going to get better. And my counter argument to you is I have learned something about recruiting that it took me, I don't know, 20 odd years of being a Badger fan to figure out there's really one key to recruiting and getting good recruits. And that's having guys go to the NFL and be successful mm -hmm. because the Badgers recruit at a national title level on the offensive line. Like if you look at this list, they have, let's see, one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten guys that by my count, and maybe I'm off by one, and I may be forgetting one for all I know. So maybe it's nine, maybe it's eleven. Ten guys who are consensus four star players. That's event. nuts. Out of, you know, what is that? Fourteen scholarship offensive linemen, something like that. That's a yeah. national title level, recruiting level. hundred percent. Why is that? Is it because offensive linemen love Wisconsin or that Wisconsin is a special place that breeds offensive linemen? Or I know people want to believe that, or they can just keep putting guy a terrible Wisconsin offensive line had two guys drafted, right? Yep. That's, that's why they get them or look at outside linebacker. You now have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight guys 
One, two, three, four, five of them are four stars. Yeah. Right. And they're in on tech at Curtis this year. And why are they? And you're not supposed to steal my thunder. Oh, my bad. I, I didn't know that was the thunder. Sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, but that's to the point. Why are they in yep. this Louisiana kid's living room? And as you pointed out to me when we were sort of doing the pre-interview, he's a guy who actively sought out a Badger offer. Yeah. Because of Joe Schobert, because of TJ Watt, because of uh, uh, Van Ginkle, because I mean, like all the, like they have, and I'm forgetting other ones. Who am I forgetting? But it doesn't matter. Tons of them. Yeah. Yeah. They have a constant stream of guys going to the NFL. So how many people you have making recruiting graphics isn't going to matter. Like, could it turn the dial a little bit? Sure. Could you, you know, go from, you know, 3% more efficient from that? Sure. But it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. It's do they put guys in the NFL? And that's in how the big picture strategically you're not making, you're, you're putting a drop of water in the ocean. That's exactly it. Like, sure. Saying. It would be nice to have five more guys doing whatever they think is going to be important in there. But do I think it's going to change the landscape radically? No. And it's not something you should even worry about. Like I get it. We all like to have things to worry about, but don't worry about it. I mean, why did they get, why did they get Ches Malusi as a transfer? Jonathan Taylor. Right. Yeah. I mean, they, they're, you can argue Jalen Berger. I mean, I get it. He transferred. Why did they get him in the first place? Jonathan Still a four-star Taylor, running back. Four-star running. And they have, they have running backs in the NFL. Yep. Right? So it, that's what it comes down to. I mean, that they need to hit. If you want this team to, to make the jump to the next level, they got to hit on some corners. corners they need yeah. some corners. Like, I think, I think Nick Nelson kind of not panning out is a real bummer for them because I thought they were going to get, that could be something they could really sell, especially now in the new transfer market. Because I'll give the Badgers credit. They were playing, well, Nick Nelson, actually to his credit, he was playing the transfer game before it was fashionable, oh, yeah. as I like yeah. to say, um, by saying, okay, I'm good at Hawaii, but if I go somewhere else, I'm going to get some more exposure. I'm very curious to see what happens with those corners because it, it, it looks like, I mean, my guess is all three of those guys are starters. I think so too. <laughs> it, it's going to be weird, but, but I mean, first off, be thankful because I don't know who the starter was going to be. Uh, I mean, it's like it was going to be Alexander Smith and dot 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 and Ricardo like, Hallman. I mean, like, Al Ashford, Hallman, no, Max like, Lofty. No, like they they yeah. absolutely fixed the secondary. Yeah, well, potentially fixed. We don't know, but they they addressed. They gave it. themselves viable bodies. Yes, let's pick up the safety way. transfer out of Utah as well. Yeah, like they, exactly. they addressed it. Um, so, no, that's a great I, place uh, to end it. Um, yeah, I, I think that's really what it is. They just need some guys to hit. And if you want them to make it, at the, if you want them to win national titles or be in that conversation, it's they've got to put guys in the NFL. No, that's a great place to end it, man. Everybody, he is Richard Branch from the Buck Around, and I will twist his arm to get him back on the show later in the season <laughs> to talk more football. No all editing right. on your end. Thank no, you make so me much, sound man. smart. Make me sound I, smart. I will take out all the ums, I promise. You don't promise. I can tell. <laughs> no, I really appreciate the time. I think everyone's going to really enjoy it. Thank you, everyone listening for the buck around or for uh, for listening to Locked On Badgers and for tuning into a fun episode with Richard Branch from the Buck Around. Um, just continue listening if you enjoy it. We really appreciate it, and we're going to continue giving more content and more guests. Thank you guys so much.